Tonight on The Henry Rollins Show, Tom Morello of Rage Against the Machine and Serge Tankian of System of a Down are here to talk about their battle to ensure social justice for all. And then an exclusive musical performance from Amen. It's going to be a great show, folks. Don't miss it. Venezuela's leader Hugo Chavez is on the move. He's ending his country's association with the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And he very recently took control of oil projects in Venezuela away from American and European companies, basically telling institutions like Chevron and ExxonMobil that it's a new day and there's new rules starting now. We have an interesting relationship with the man and his country's oil. We are his biggest customer. But Venezuelan crude oil imports make up only a small fraction of our overall vampiric appetite. Chavez does not mince words when it comes to his hatred of the Bush administration and America's policies in South America. In September of 2006, Chavez came to New York and called President Bush the devil, which prompted some of the most fervent Bush bashers to say, shut up, you can't say that, he's our devil. Now it would be stupid not to consider that Hugo Chavez could exert considerable influence on other countries in South America. Could he be trying to change the South American continent from the U.S.'s compliant bitch boy to a rebellious continent that is united in its hatred and contempt for the United States and years of domination and imperialism? Could it be that Mr. Chavez is lining himself up for a sweet little assassination? In 2005, the ever frisky Pat Robertson said that killing Chavez would be a whole lot cheaper than starting a war. And I know we're a little low on funds right now since all of our monies, resources, troop strength and weapons are tied up in a little investment deal we started a while ago. But all the same, the fiery rhetoric of Hugo Chavez that, by the way, does not include invading, terrorizing or in any way waging war on the United States could be spun by the White House, cast into the media pool, inhaled by the submissive media, repackaged and broadcast into America's collective consciousness as fighting words, and it's fare ye well, Hugo, and back to the good old days. Serge Tankian and Tom Morello are joining us tonight. As you probably know, Serge is the lead singer and instrumentalist from the band System of a Down, and Tom is the legendary guitarist of the recently reunited Rage Against the Machine. Both have new solo projects. Tom just released a debut album under the name of the Night Watchman entitled One Man Revolution, and Serge is finishing work on his record entitled Elect the Dead. With a passion for political and social activism beyond their love of music, these two formed Axis of Justice, a nonprofit organization dedicated to bringing musicians, fans of music, and grassroots political organizations together to fight for social justice. Gentlemen, it's good to have you here. Pleasure. Tom, um, what's going on? Sir, Senator. Um, what led you two to form Axis of Justice? Uh, Axis of Justice, the, the genesis of it was. Uh, a trip that I made to an OzFest concert about seven years ago now. I was at San Bernardino, and I was appalled by the number of white power and Nazi tattoos I saw guys comfortable flying at the show, where on the main stage, every single one of the bands on the you know, headlining on the main stage had at least one non-white member in the band. And I was like, yeah, this is my, this is my music, too. Like, how, it, like, this is not like some white power rally. This is a heavy metal show, and I'm down, and what, what's the problem? The next year, System was headlining OzFest, and Serge and I got together to have formed the Axis of Justice organization and had an anti-racist message and an Axis of Justice booth at every one of the shows. And that's how it started. And we had a number of organizations from Amnesty International to the Armenian National Committee of America to 
a number of uh, nonprofit organizations. We became an umbrella for different nonprofits at different, you know, festivals. And these festivals, uh, people with booths often call these festivals, you know, as I, I did Lollapalooza like in 1851. <laughs> and, um, and Perry was all about the booths. You know, yeah, he's yeah. going to get you know, the pro gun and the anti gun people all together and just let everyone decide. <laughs> yeah. uh, God sort of out. Yeah. And um, so I'm, I'm sure it was fairly easy for you to start uh, accruing people to set up and, and hand out pamphlets. And, yeah, it was great. That's great. Yeah, the um, thing, the thing, we were, thing we were surprised about was that was the inception of, of Access of Justice. And then it grew from there very organically. I mean, we tried to answer the question that fans have asked us for you know, 10 years or so is, how do I get involved? You know, kids who are either motivated by the music or are motivated aside from the music, looking for ways to plug in in their suburb or in their inner city or in their country town. Um, you know, to get involved in issues of social justice. So then we tried to make accessofjustice.org a watering hole for potential activists uh, that, are, that were reached by our music. Was there at any point a, a, a tipping point, besides the, like the OzFest thing, seeing all the, the yahoos or the white power stuff, was there something that, that, that you saw, perhaps, or that, that a tipping point for you, where you said you had to be poli a politically active person? Growing up, um, the issue of the, the hypocrisy behind the denial of the Armenian genocide in America and other countries made me um, wonder how many other truths are there that are not displayed, you know, for, for our consumption. And, you know, it made me go, shit, man, there's so many injustices out there. This is just the tip of the iceberg. So it made me start researching and I started becoming involved in other activism, other political activities. And when we formed Access, we, I think we both felt the need to have some type of representation with our fans above and beyond our just our music and our art, which is expressive enough uh, given, but um, to be able to actually do social change, to be, to be able to actually make change happen. And um, that's, that's really a part of it. And it happened by accident, really, yeah. or whatever you believe in. Yeah, accidents, yeah. <laughs> you know? Let's talk about some of the, su the successes that you guys have achieved. Uh, the uh, the McDonald's thing is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's, there's been there's been many, but uh, we'll, we'll flush well, that one. Out sure, the, sure. The uh, the Immokalee. There's a place in Florida called Immok the town of Immokalee, where most of the produce is grown for Burger King, McDonald's, Taco Bell. And a few years ago, Access of Justice was involved in supporting the Immokalee farm workers in a campaign against Taco Bell. It was to get just like the barest minimum, you know, like a living wage, decent working conditions in the fields, you know, the lack of, of pesticides on the workers. And they were 100% successful in their, uh, in their struggle against Taco Bell to achieve those demands. We were a small part of that struggle, organized benefit concerts for it, and helped promote the boycott. The next target was McDonald's, which uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Zach De La Rocha and I actually played a benefit show. It was set to be in, uh, the kickoff of the campaign against McDonald's, but I think they heard we were coming. McDonald's caved to all the workers' demands prior to even the inception, so it turned into a victory celebration. So that's right. that. Do you think a musician has a responsibility uh, to talk about this stuff, either in a lyric or between songs, or you know, to their audience? Personally, myself, I don't. I don't think. I don't think uh, politic politicization. Uh, nor responsibility of social kind is, is something we should feel responsible for as artists. I think it comes naturally to certain people and not to others. Um, I think it's more about following your heart and doing whatever you feel is right, you know, and if that's a part of what you do musically, then fine. And if it's not, that's fine. I think everyone feels passionate about something. A lot of artists feel passionate about something. It's just different, you know, uh, focuses. You have to admit, um, this administration uh, either it's politicized a lot of musicians or has moved them so much to where people you wouldn't think were political or had an opinion, all of a sudden they're writing songs. Yeah. Uh, they're mouthing off at award shows yeah. and, and infuriating uh, people uh, somewhere. <laughs> um, you know, Dixie Chicks, yeah. what have you. Uh, and do, what, what do you all think about that? Well, well, I mean, bad presidents make for good music. I mean, that's, that's something that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's crystal clear. Uh, and I, I think that, that you have only one responsibility as an artist, and that's to tell the truth as you see it. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't expect sort of non-political people to pretend they are. But I think that you're, the reason why you're seeing this, you know, this constant influx in the, over the course of the last 18 months of artists speaking out is because they're really pissed off. Not because artists are pissed off, everybody's pissed off. Yeah. It was the worst administration in the history of our country, yeah. you know, um, both domestically and internationally. You know, we've got a war criminal in the White House. You know, we've got civ civil liberties rolled back here. Gas prices are at an all-time high. And the environment may not be there for our children in their old age. Um, 
there's reason, you know, artists write songs about it. My hope is that beyond artists writing songs about it, that, you know, students stand up in their campuses, that carpenters do it through their carpenters union, that people in whatever their vocation is, uh, let their voices be heard. I think it's important not to react and to proact, you know, in terms of artists, in terms of songs that we write, you know, like uh, before the Iraq war, we uh, did a video with Michael Moore called Boom, you know, and that that actually landed on MTV the day the war was starting, you know, and it was based on all of all of the um, 10 million people protesting before the war against the war that hadn't happened yet, you know, and um, you know, I think it's important. It, everyone can can always come back and say when the whole public already agrees with you, it's easy to say this is wrong, but it's hard to say it when everyone's yelling at you and taking your song off the radio, you know, and uh, blaming you for stuff and calling you anti-American just because you're following your heart and actually saying what you feel and putting your ass on the line. Yeah, being wholly American. Yeah, yeah. being yeah. wholly American, 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 very American. Yeah. yeah. For you, Tom, um, what's it like reuniting Rage Against the Machine in the current political climate? Uh, uh, right, you know, this is maybe like the perfect band for right now, yeah, mm, yeah. you know. Well, I mean, the, the funny thing is, like, Rage Against the Machine was all wound up about the Clinton administration. You know, like that seems, <laughs> that seems like, like yeah, we, were, we were pissed, yeah, yeah, like crazy. Yeah. You know, uh, and now we sort of descend downtown Staples Center. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so, I mean, I think that I mean that was definitely one of the one of the major part of the major impetus behind doing the reunion now was because you know in the last six and a half years how the country's slid into a right wing purgatory and that and and that that everyone should use whatever means at their disposal to speak out against it to act against it and so Coachella we thought was a was a pretty huge stage for that band to make a return and sure. to you know and to let the, those songs to me didn't fit, you know playing on you know that stage in front of you know whatever 50 or 60,000 people didn't feel the least bit nostalgic it felt like they were songs kind of written for that moment right so System of a Down, are you at liberty to disclose the status of that band? It's actually very confidential. No, yeah, of course. Um, we just decided to kind of take time and do our own thing. Okay. And if we, you know, uh, we just didn't set a timetable. I mean, if we want to do something in the future, we'll get together. If all four of us feel like doing something as System, we'll get together and do it. And if we don't, then we keep, keep on doing our own things. It's not, there's no laws. I mean, the thing about bands that I've noticed being in one for 11 years is that People expect it to be a, um, a uh, permanent institution. And that's fine if that works, you know. But I think, like, for the sake of art itself, I like seeing different, thing, different people doing different things outside of their group and taking time and effort to focus on those things as well. I think it grows for the band. I mean, it's a growth thing when they get back to the band and as individuals as well. I think music is too um, precious for it to be limited between just a, a, a select group of people and just to see those people your whole life play that one group kind of thing. I don't know, that's just how I am. But, um, but we're all friends, we're cool with each other and, and uh, if we want to do it again, we get together and do it again. If we want to do a benefit show, whatever, the door's open, cool. we're cool. Yeah, cool. Yeah, you know, if you think about it, I mean, both of you guys have a lot of records and you love music. You, you, thinking about it that way, you wonder maybe some bands should have taken some breaks from each other. Yeah. If not to play with other people, just to not write, tour, record, write, tour, record, right, that right, whole thing. Right. They may be like, you know, even a band like Zeppelin or Sap, the big bands, cool bands, yeah. should have taken a year to go, I don't know. Yeah. Well, you got the record contracts, delivery deadlines, all this stuff happening. And, and that's another part of the pressure, that it makes you into, into an established product. And that's the last thing System wants to be, you know? I mean, we're, we're the ones saying fuck you to the product, you know? So it's like... It is nice when you get away from it for a moment because you come back to it with this new gear. And I don't think enough musicians, uh, they, they lose out on their own potential by not opening the jar and like getting more air into the, into the thing. Um, last question for you guys, and, and perhaps the most important. There's so many people, young people, all kinds of people in America who are concerned, who see these headlines, and they're like, this is awful. These are, you know, dead Iraqis, dead Americans. It all sucks. But I'm in Minnesota, what can I do? And it's, it's that inability to feel like you have movement and power and the ability to be proactive that cripples not only themselves, but the rest of us. Absolutely. So what can you all recommend for people who want to be involved to become involved and become not inert, but active in moving? I mean, the first thing is to realize that you, that you are an agent of history. History is not stuffy dates and facts and kings and queens and things that happened in the past, what you do today and in your lifetime 
determines what happens now and what happens in the future. That's how history happens. And that's when there's progressive change, radical change, or revolutionary change, it comes from the bottom. It comes from people who's, it's not some, it's not getting the right president into office. It's not getting, it's not packing the Supreme Court the right way. That's not how women got the right to vote. That's not how lunch counters got desegregated. It's not how the Berlin Wall fell, and it's not how apartheid ended. It's because people stood up in Minnesota or in Soweto, they stood up for their rights where they live, where they work, and where they go to school in an uncompromising way and used their intellect, used their power, used their creativity, used what, used who they were and band it together to make change. That's how it happens. And I think that it's e very easy to, there's, there's like an, uh, uh, an atomization that occurs where it's, you feel comfortable in front of your PlayStation alone or with your bro, or mm -hmm. comfortable in front of your MySpace page, but, and, and, and just sort of let the world happen outside of that. But that's not how change happens. Change happens by standing up. And realize that it's that feeling of impotence that's causing all of this. We're part of the problem. We're creating this problem, you know? I'm as responsible as Bush is. You know, once you realize that, then, then you, you, it starts to change. And, you know, there's a lot people can do. I mean, that's what they don't realize. It's that you got to get rid of that impotence. You know, once you do, you become empowered. And then you get together with other people that become empowered, and it grows like fire. Thank you so much. This is a, a tremendous interview. Uh, it, you guys are very inspiring to me as artists and as activists. And uh, you got me fired up. <laughs> and uh, I'm cool. usually pretty fired anyway. <laughs> but, uh, so that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for Thanks very much. Search. Right on, man. Coming up later in the show, an exclusive musical performance from Amen. But first, here's Janine Garofalo with this week's Disquisition. You know what I would say to so many people who, who, who continue to embrace uh, the, the, the corporate ethos and the authoritarian nature of the Republican Party? I would say to you, get a dominatrix, have someone pee on you, do something, and stop debilitating society. Here's what we are if we do not understand how our government and how the corporation works and if we do not try and take some time uh, to, to uh, take an interest in the political process or the uh, degradation of the media and media consolidation. Ava Braun, Hitler's girlfriend. Is that who you want to be? Do you really, do you really want to be Hitler's girlfriend? Do you really want to be the type of person who would date Hitler. I don't think that's who you want to be. Do you want to be squeaky from on the Manson Ranch? But uh, sitting in a hole on Spawn Ranch, waiting for the end of days to be nigh, listening to the Beatles' White Album and thinking that it's talking to you. Do you really want to be squeaky from or, or Ava Braun or Ted Haggard's lover? I don't think so. Do you really want to be Jack Abramoff's wife? I mean, it's one thing to be Jack Abramoff, but to be the woman who marries or has an affair with or is attracted to Jack Abramoff, that to me is even worse. Because th there is just that, to be Lynn Cheney, that is even worse than being Dick Cheney, although Lynn Cheney is just horrible on her own. But somebody was fucking Joe McCarthy, and that is what I'm talking about. That is, is that who you want to be? Is the person who fucks Joe McCarthy? I don't think so. That's the, that is entirely my point. That was all, that was everything I was trying to say without hurting your feelings or seeming to be um, somewhat arrogant. Because believe me, nobody has lower self-esteem than me, but not to the point where I'm gonna fuck Joe McCarthy. Not like that. Or not to the point where I would stand behind uh, George Bush as a rally going, what's your plan? Like when they mouth along with him, there is, there is far more dignity in being uh, Ted Haggard's uh, methamphetamine supplier and then taking it in the ass, Ted Hackert. 
I have to stop talking about that because I don't want to talk about fist fucking in the evangelical church anymore. Tonight's musical guest is Amen. Amen has been led by the one-man wrecking crew known as Casey Chaos. I met Casey before his start in music at a Black Flag show when he was just a kid and have had the privilege of watching him evolve as an uncompromising artist. If you've ever heard the band or seen them play, then you are as amazed as I am that the man is still standing. I can only hope there's something left of the place when they're done. Here to play Coma America, this is Amen, live and uncut.
That's our show for tonight. Thanks again to our guests, Amen, Tom Morello, and Serge Tankian. And for more information on the Axis of Justice, please go to axisofjustice.org. See you next time.